When most people think of extreme right-wing Christian fundamentalists, the kind who do nothing but preach hate and an impossible moral standard that they themselves can't even live by, most people tend to think of America. Let's face it, America has never been short of these lying, exploitative, money-grubbing, bigoted, unethical, moral hypocrites for Jesus Christ. Fred Phelps, Jerry Falwell, Billy Graham, Kent Hovind, Pat Robertson, the list goes on and on. It is often believed that this particular breed of Christian extremists only exists within the United States and in no other developed first world Christian countries anywhere else in the world. Well, to all you Americans watching this, I've got some good news for you. You are not the only ones. Everybody has to deal with their own homegrown versions of these fucking imbeciles at some point. Now, sadly, it is true that in America there are more Christian fundamentalists than anywhere else in the world, and not just in the general population, but also, most importantly, in positions of power and influence. However, in this video I thought I'd give all you Yanks out there a chance to laugh at someone else's insane and hateful Bible thumpers, specifically a British one. So sit back and relax folks, because this is going to be a bumpy ride. I'm Dick Coughlin from whatacuntyouare.com and let me tell y'all about the rise and fall of a right little nasty cunt called Stephen Green. The odds are most of you watching this, even those of you who live in the UK, are sat there right now all thinking to yourself, who the plunking bollards is Stephen Green? Thankfully these days his star has well and truly fallen, crashed and burned the fuck out. Nowhere is this more obvious or evident than his Twitter account, which at the time of recording this only has a paltry 53 followers. Quite the come down from the days when he had a couple of thousand people following him. Green Green is the founder, leader, spokesman, and in recent years, the only staff member of Christian Voice, which is a Christian advocacy group whose official mission statement and objective is to, quote, uphold Christianity as the faith of the United Kingdom, to be a voice for biblical values in law and public policy, and to defend and support traditional family life, end quote. Stephen Green's life as an activist for Jesus began with a group called the Conservative Family Campaign, which described itself as Christian advocates for protecting the traditional family unit and values. Translation, they hated gays and most women's rights. Green eventually rose to become the chairman of the CFC, but in 1994 he stepped down and left in order to start his own group called Christian Voice. The catalyst for Christian Voice's creation was, curiously enough, when Conservative MP Edwina Curry in February of 1994 proposed a legal amendment that would have allowed and lowered the age of consent for homosexuals from 21 to 16. This proposal lost by 27 votes. Christian Voice has a very clear set of goals and demands. Primarily, they want the Bible to be the basis for all British law. But which parts of the Bible, I hear you ask? Well, thankfully, Stephen has already decided what those are for us. Obviously, the criminalisation of homosexuality is his main priority. And to prove that he ain't fucking around, in 2009, Green was literally the only British person to openly voice his full support for Uganda's decision to make homosexuality punishable by death. Next on the agenda is taking away a woman's right to choose and making abortion completely illegal. According to Green, abortion in the UK is not just comparable, but even worse than the Holocaust. Christian Voice also want to ban married couples from getting a no-fault divorce, as well as any forms of sex education at schools. Now, whilst all of these ideas are objectively awful, they are pretty commonplace amongst right-wing Christian extremists. However, Christian Voice also championed another cause that's much less common. Green wanted to overturn the law on so-called marital rape, which was not even legally recognised in the UK until 1994. Prior to then, it was legally impossible for a husband to rape his wife. And Stephen Green wanted to repeal that law, stating that the promises given by a man and woman to each other during the marriage service in the Book of Common Prayer establish a binding consent to sexual intercourse. 
Despite forming in 1994, Christian Voice didn't really start getting noticed until 2003, when they decided to launch a crusade against the Gay Police Association, who were an advocacy group which was founded in 1990 to represent the needs and interests of all gay and bisexual police officers within the UK. Unsurprisingly, Green was vehemently opposed to the GPA, but he was specifically outraged over the fact that police officers were allowed to participate in gay pride marches. In 2003, Christian Voice wrote letters of complaint to the chief constables of every single police force in the UK and demanded they stop allowing their officers to take part in events such as gay pride because, in their words, homosexuality is characterised by disease, degradation, death and denial. Green received replies from all 52 chief constables in the UK, all of whom universally supported the rights of their LGBT police officers to freely express themselves. Green immediately published all of these replies on his website, along with the constabulary in the UK from whence they came, so that all of his followers could see how much their local police force supported gay rights. In 2006, Green was arrested whilst handing out leaflets urging gay people to turn away from their sins during the Cardiff Mardi Gras. Police on the scene determined the content of these leaflets to be hate speech, and Green was immediately arrested and taken away. Several weeks later, the Crown Prosecution Service decided to drop the charges against Green on grounds of insufficient evidence. With his profile rising and the media giving him more oxygen, Green's confidence was growing. He was looking for a new enemy to target that would continue to garner him even more attention and he thought he had found it in 2005 in the unlikely form of a satirical comedy musical called Jerry Springer the Opera. Jerry Springer the Opera was written by stand-up comedian Stuart Lee and musician Richard Thomas. It debuted in theatres in 2001 and by 2004 it had received huge critical acclaim and won many awards including four Laurence Olivier Awards. Here's a brief synopsis of the show. During a recording of his TV show, Jerry Springer is accidentally shot by a dancing clansman. Jerry wakes up in purgatory and is told that Satan will spare his soul if he goes to hell to host a special edition of the show. The guests include Satan, Jesus, Adam and Eve, Mary and God. In the end, Jerry is sent back to Earth where he gives his final thoughts, but ultimately dies. By 2005 the musical had become so popular that the BBC announced that they would be airing an uncensored performance of the musical on the BBC Two channel. The musical was due to be shown on January the 8th but by January the 7th, the BBC announced that it had already received 47,000 complaints about its decision to broadcast Jerry Springer the Opera, which, at the time, was the highest number of complaints any TV show had ever received. It would ultimately go on to receive even more, topping off at 63,000. But this did not deter the BBC, who, as promised, went ahead with the broadcast. As well as bombarding them with complaints, Christian Voice also protested outside BBC BBC studios in London, Manchester and seven other locations. Green, Jerry Springer the Opera, portrayed Jesus Christ as a nappy-wearing sexual deviant who claimed that he was a little bit gay. It called Mary a rape victim, said the birth of Jesus was because the condom split, ridiculed his wounds on the cross and sacrament of Holy Communion, had God as an ineffectual old man who needed guidance from Jerry Springer and finished up with Springer as a counterfeit saviour of mankind who told Jesus to grow up for Christ's sake and put some fucking clothes on. But Green was not done yet not by a long shot. He was no longer just out for attention and notoriety, he actually wanted to bring Jerry Springer the opera down at any cost. He started by publishing the home addresses and telephone numbers of two top BBC executives, Jana Bennett, director of television, and the BBC Two controller, Roly Keating. Keating received several death threats and was forced to go into hiding for a brief period. In February 2005, the cast of Jerry Springer the Opera agreed to waive their wages for a one-off performance of the show with the money, £3,000, being donated to a charity called Maggie's, which offers help to anyone who has been affected by cancer. When Green heard about this, he 
presumably, did exactly what Jesus would have done. He contacted Maggie's and told them not to accept this donation, otherwise Christian Voice would begin picketing outside their help centres. Maggie's, understandably not wanting to risk causing their patients any more distress or anxiety than they already felt, decided not to accept the £3,000 donation. At this point, Stephen Green was like, do I have everybody's attention now? Throughout all of 2006, Christian Voice would maintain a presence of protesters outside any theatre that was running Jerry Springer the Opera. This had a direct detrimental effect on the success of the show because many venues would cancel because they didn't want to have to deal with Christian Voice or the negative publicity that went along with it. So, with the controller of the BBC Two in hiding, Jerry Springer the Opera in financial peril and cancer patients unnecessarily suffering, Steve Stephen Green was understandably feeling pretty full of himself by the end of 2006. But he still wasn't done, although I'm sure if Green knew what he does now, he would have taken his chips at that moment and gone home, claiming victory. But in the immortal words of Mystical, every motherfucker is smarter than Albert Einstein when they're looking from hindsight. On January the 8th, 2007, exactly two years after the broadcast of BBC Two's Jerry Springer the Opera, Stephen Green submitted papers to Horsfury Road Magistrates Court in order to pursue private prosecutions against BBC Director General Mark Thompson and Jerry Springer the Opera producer Jonathan Thoday. For what you may ask? Blasphemy. Now, you may well be sat there laughing and or rolling your eyes at the very idea of someone being prosecuted in the UK for blasphemy in the 21st century. But, believe it or not, both blasphemy and blasphemous libel were still technically criminal acts, even in 2007, but not for long. Initially, Green's submission was immediately rejected by the courts because it was quickly determined that there was a distinct lack of evidence that any crime had been committed. The court also cited the 1968 Theatres Act, which, quote, enshrines the right of free expression in theatrical works, unquote. But Green would not be deterred, so he decided to take this case and appeal to the High Court of Justice who also dismissed the case, on the exact same grounds as before. So Green took his last roll of the dice and appealed the High Court's decision to the House of Lords, who, on March the 5th, 2008, ruled in favour of the High Court's decision, stating that Green's petition, quote, did not raise an arguable point of law of general public importance, unquote. Not only did he lose the case, but he was ordered to pay the legal fees of both Mark Thompson and Jonathan Thoday, which came to a grand total of £90,000. By June of 2008, Stephen Green still had not paid a penny of this money, and at one point he got so desperate he even had the gall to write to Mark Thompson and Jonathan Thoday to ask them if they would be so kind as to let him off his payment, saying, quote, in the interest of goodwill and justice, Stephen Green said, Thoday can easily afford to waive his costs as well. He lost half a million pounds over the failed tour of Jerry Springer the Opera in 2006 and didn't bat an eyelid, so he isn't exactly short of money either. It should be enough for Mark Thompson and Jonathan Thoday that they got away with blasphemy, at least in this life. For these rich and powerful men to pursue me into bankruptcy courts over money I don't have would be vindictive. Quite simply, I do not have the money. And certainly, I will end up bankrupt if Thompson and Thoday decide to enforce these punitive costs. Ah, didums. Stephen Green even resorted to setting up an online petition asking to be spared these legal fees, which ended up receiving a whopping 944 signatures. Stephen Green had been legally bitch-slapped, publicly humiliated, and was facing bankruptcy. Surely, things couldn't possibly get any worse, could they? In 2008, Parliament passed the 2008 Criminal Justice and Immigration Act, which included, within its text, the abolition of blasphemy and blasphemous libel laws as criminal offences. 
Not only that, but these two amendments were added to the Act as a direct consequence of Stephen Green's year-long battle against Jerry Springer the Opera, which had successfully highlighted how outdated and unenforceable both these blasphemy laws were in the modern day. So bravo to you, Stephen Green. Since then, Stephen Green has completely fallen off the media and the public's radar. He made a brief reappearance in 2009 when he spoke out against the atheist bust campaign when several London buses had banners saying there's probably no God so stop worrying and enjoy your life. But after 2008, any instances of him being featured in any mainstream media was simply to serve as the sum nutter for the rest of us to point and laugh at demographic. But in 2011, we learned that there was nothing funny when it came to Stephen Green. In January 2011, the Daily Mail published an interview with Caroline Green, the now ex-wife of Stephen Green. She had left Stephen in 2006 after her brother loaned her the money for her to be able to buy a mobile home so she and her three children could escape what she referred to as Stephen's violent tyranny. If you're wondering how anyone could possibly meet someone like Stephen Green, and end up married to him and having four kids. Well, apparently, according to Caroline, he was a different man when she first met him. He was a very talented, outgoing man, and with a great sense of fun and humour, she recalls. He had a great sense of humour. He was also an accomplished musician. He played in the Salida Band and belonged to a Morris dancing troupe. Caroline lived with Stephen for a year before deciding to marry him. She had been raised Catholic, but was by her own admission, quote, not very devout. They were married in 1980. It was shortly after their wedding that Stephen began to become progressively more and more extreme in his views. He became a vociferous member of the anti-abortion campaign Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child and then joined the Conservative Family Campaign. In 1992, he wrote a virulently anti-gay book, The Sexual Dead End, which Caroline says marked the beginning of the end. Two years later, he abandoned the Conservative family campaign, which he regarded as being too moderate, and then set up Christian Voice in order to pursue a more radical course. In 1997, they moved from the home counties to a very remote small holding in Carmarthenshire, West Wales. At first, Caroline embraced this change and believed it would be good for everyone, but her optimism could not have been more misplaced or misjudged. She quickly realised Stephen had a much more sinister agenda. He wanted to remove his family from, quote, the evils and temptations of urban life, and instead he wanted to isolate them in a place where he could exert complete and total control over them. He forced them to live in a cramped, cold and dilapidated mobile home. He told Caroline that this was only a temporary measure until he had renovated the nearby derelict farmhouse which he had also bought. But the truth was he never had any intention of doing this. Quote, First, he told us the Bible decreed we should work the land before rebuilding the house. He used the kids as child labour. They had to plant seeds, cultivate crops and harvest them. They had very little free time. Caroline's freedom was also restricted. Quote, if I spoke to a friend on the phone for too long, Stephen would tell me off for gossiping. My free time consisted of visiting the supermarket. Even when I helped out at a Christian centre, he would be insanely jealous. In the end, nobody visited. We became virtual recluses. He had a very high expectations of the children. Nothing they did was ever good enough. He bullied them mentally and manipulated them, and they always had to be chaperoned. He wouldn't countenance them having boyfriends or girlfriends. It is hard to overstate the extent of his control. We were shut off from the world. The only respite that they ever got was when Stephen went away on Christian voice related business, but every time he returned, he seemed to be even more extreme than he was before. This abuse inevitably went from verbal and psychological to physical. 
Stephen would regularly beat Caroline and his children until one day when he finally went so far that Caroline could not take any more. His final act of violence against her was all the more chilling because it was coldly premeditated. Stephen Green wrote a list of his wife's failings and then described the weapon he would make to beat her with. Quote, he told me he'd make a piece of wood into a sort of witch's broom and hit me with it, which he did. He hit me until I bled. I was terrified. I can still remember the pain. Stephen listed my misdemeanours. I was disrespectful and disobedient. I wasn't loving or submissive enough, and I was undermining him. He also said I wasn't giving him his conjugal rights. He even framed our marriage vows. He always put a particular emphasis on my promise to obey him, and he hung them over our bed. He believed there was no such thing as marital rape, and for years I'd been reluctant to have sex with him, but he said it was my duty and was angry if I refused him. But the beating was the last straw. It convinced me I had to divorce him. When this interview was published, it would be the last time that Stephen Green would ever appear in any mainstream media outlet. Stephen Green's 15 minutes of infamy was well and truly over. The last time he appeared on anything close to mainstream media was in 2019 when he spoke to Nick Ferrari on LBC Radio, which went about as well as you'd expect. At what age, then, can a child start to learn just the initial aspects of an LGBT community? What are, we, what are they actually teaching them? Well, that some children come where there are two dads or two mums. Yeah. In other words, it's a propaganda exercise. It's no, not no, to no, do sorry, with no, hold uh, on, hold on. no, no, no. I'm sorry, you probably know. Stephen what? Green is and always will be an evil and monstrous bastard who, quite frankly, has never received the punishment he truly deserves, and he probably never will. We can only hope that his total lack of relevance stays with him for the rest of his life and that this is one Christian who remains forever voiceless. My name's Brother Neuro, this is whatacuntyouare.com, and where there's no sense, there's no feeling. Good night, may God be less.